that kind of uncertainty that can sometimes build up, and I think it can happen to most of us. Um, you know, do you wonder, am I living a life that's pleasing enough to God, uh, and am I honoring him enough that I'm going to be okay in the end? Am I obeying God's commands enough? You know, those are legitimate questions. And when, we're not that, when we lose our confidence, it really does take us into a place of insecurity, and it's not a very nice place to be. So, the first thing I want to say, and the first, the first point we're going to make is, and that's an ultimately a key point, is to know that our salvation is certain. It cannot be taken away from you. Once you are saved, you are saved once and forever and once for all. And really, that is the first thing that I take out of this passage. Your salvation is certain. It cannot be taken away from you. And in actual fact, I'm going to reinforce it by looking at some verses elsewhere in the Bible that says exactly that. So we've got John chapter, uh, well actually Romans chapter 8, for I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor principality nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God within Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing, absolutely nothing. And, no, and note this, not even stuff that will happen in the future. Not the stuff that happened in the past, but not what will happen in the future. Jesus said in, in John 5, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into this judgment, but has passed out to death and to life. It is quite clear. If you believe, you are saved. It's, it's a no ifs, no buts in any of these passages. Again, Jesus says it in chapter 10, I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. Nobody can take you away from Jesus once you've given yourself to him. And coming back to today's passage, verse 1 and 2 says exactly that. Everyone who believes that Jesus Christ is born of God and everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. This is how we know that we love the children of God by loving and carrying out his command. And that's going to feed us to the rest. But that's where John starts. Look, it's a dead cert. You believe, you saved, end of. And that actually is a distinguishing factor with every other world religion, is that absolute certainty that of your salvation. A Muslim doesn't know for sure until the end. A Hindu doesn't know what he's going to be reincarnated in, or Buddhist, not sure. Anyway, doesn't matter. I mean, potentially even a Catholic person has got this worry, have I done enough good stuff in my life to be right? And you go back to the ancient Egyptians. Do you remember the ancient Egyptians were their gods? If you look at what went, when they died, there was a scale. How much good? Oh, it's going to write away. Oh, how much bad? Did I steal? No. Did I steal? And it's, like, it's all world religion. I've got this balance, and hopefully the scales will balance the right way, and you'll make it to heaven. None of that. Your assurance of salvation is a dead cert. Jesus did it once and for all. And that's absolutely incredible. So, if you ever feel uncertain, just remind yourself of this. Nothing is more certain in life than death, taxes, and your salvation. I like that one. Always, people always say that, death and taxes. Well, death, taxes, and your salvation are the three things you can be sure of in your life. Um, and if you don't do the second, you know you'll be in trouble at some point. But once, you, once you've done that, once you've reassured yourself, you're good. And actually, if ever you have that sense of insecurity, I would encourage you to use it to your advantage. Because actually, sometimes we might reach a point in our lives where we might be thinking, I'm meant to be saved here, but the life I'm leading is not showing very much of that. And I've got every right to ask myself the question whether Jesus is still going to save me. So actually... If you ever have that sense of insecurity, then maybe it's God talking to you and telling you that something needs to be done somewhere in your life. Because it's, it's not just as simple as, well, you save, that's fine, do whatever you want, it's all good. It's not that simple. Uh, so, not for security's sake, not for the fear of losing your salvation, but because it's the right thing to do, if you ever have that sense of insecurity, see it as God talking to you, knocking on your door, God's spirit saying, hey, Maybe something needs to happen. And actually what this passage does, it gives us the three key strands, the key things that you should see in your life 
to see that your life being saved is being lived in the way that really ought to be. And I see three strands in this passage. Is one, you know you are saved if you love God. The second is if you obey his commandments. And the third is if you love his children. So, how do you know that you love God? That's a weird question. How do I know? How can I say, well, yeah, I love God. Look, it's obvious because X, Y, and Z. And it's an interesting one, isn't it? And it w- actually, there's an immediate way that God that the, it says how you would know you love God. But in principle, you know, what do you think of when you first wake up in the morning? What do you think of when you die? Oh, sorry, when you fall asleep at night. <laughs> sorry. No. It was not meant to be a joke. That's just completely slip of the tongue. <laughs> Um, and what, what, when you look at nature and you look at the beauty of nature, do you see God in it? Do you see God in everything around you? You know, when something's on your mind, do you feel like talking to God about it? When something worries you, when you're scared, when you're happy, how often is God on your mind? You know, that's a good, that's a good test as to whether you really love God. How much of your daily thought is linked to God? We, are, we can all have really busy lives where we're like, whoa, I've been so busy and I'm about to fix a million things and the kids and the work and the this and the that. You know, but you will know that apart from that, where, um, where, do you see, where do you see God in that? And actually, it's, it is quite fundamental to the Christian faith because you look at the first three commandments in the Ten Commandments. Could anybody remember what they say? The first three, there's ten, I need the first three. That's right, it's about God. What's the second saying? I'm not trying to catch you, don't worry. If I was sat next to you, I'd be dead nervous now. It, it, yes, yes, that's right. But you shall not take the, the name of the Lord of God in vain. And the third one, remember to keep the Lord's day. The first three commandments are just about God and your attitude towards God. The rest is about your life, and we're not going to go to those. And as we know, Jesus took ten and made it down to two, two commandments. What is the first commandment that Jesus gave us? To love your God. So that's that one. You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your being, and with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. We're down to two, and God takes 50%. Loving God. So you can see why that's an important one. And actually, leading to the second one, uh, to this, my second point, is the way to show that you love God is to keep his commands. That's what he says. And actually, what the passage says here, so we're now going to my second point, obeying his commands. And John says this, and his commands are not burdensome, for everyone born of God overcomes the world. Now, they are to take a double take. I don't know if you all agree with that point, that to follow God's command is not burdensome. It's a really key, you know, I almost passed it by, but I thought, oh, It is not burdensome to obey God's commands. Well, when I have to get up on a Sunday morning to be here to church for 10.30 and rather than having a lie-in, is that not burdensome? The Bible tells us to give away 10% of what we earn. Is that not burdensome? I can't even swear. Is that not burdensome? And I can't even explore my sexual desires because the Bible tells me that and it's at odds with God's commands. And that's just to start... If I'm reflecting really honestly, when I read this passage, it's not burdensome to follow God's commands. You could look at this and say, don't agree with that. Don't agree with that at all. But actually, Jesus himself said something almost identical um, when he spoke in Matthew 11. Jesus said this, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So Jesus was of that opinion as well, that being a Christian, following God, is not burdensome. So what's your yoke, by the way? Um, it's not something we use quite commonly. I feel it's going to be really patronizing, but do they still use yokes in the fields in India? On, do they manually um, plow? So a yoke is what you put on uh, the cattle and to f- fit the equipment to then plow the fields, etc., etc. So a yoke is that thing you stick on your shoulder and you're going to pull. So of course, that might feel really hard work to pull that. But Jesus is using that illustration to say... So my yoke is easy, my burden is light. So John and Jesus saying, actually, following God's commands 
is not meant to be difficult. And I wanted to stop really and linger on this burdensome because it's a really big deal in living our lives, isn't it? Um, you know, I think the reason is to, the, 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 this re it's such an important thing to understand because we can be so easily overwhelmed by all the commands and exhortations uh, we find in the Bible. You know, some people say, well, the Bible says to do this, but don't do that. Go here, but don't go there. Say this, but don't say that. You know, and it goes on and on and on. And actually, one reason why a lot of people say, I don't want to be a Christian because there's just too many rules and it just seems like a big set of rules to follow and I am not interested. It's just going to be too hard. Because actually, some people just see Christianity as a set of prohibitions of taboos and you shall not and you shall not and you shall do and you shall do. So, looking, it's, it's worth stopping at this concept and analyzing for ourselves do we think being a Christian is burdensome or is it not? So, I had a bit, I had a bit look because at the end of the day, you know, how do you feel about all these encouragements that you find in the Bible? You know, do you, do you sometimes find them unappealing? You know, why do we tend to bristle when we're told what to do and what not to do? And I'm going to give you three reasons. We're going to linger on this for a little while. Hopefully you'll bear with me because I think it's really important if we are to tackle our Christian life honestly. Well, the first is quite simply that we just don't want to do it, you know. If, for example, we get told not to be sexually immoral, and I'm not going to go into the details of what that might mean, well, some people will recoil at that. They say, I want to be sexually immoral. You know, I enjoy it. It feels good to explore my sexuality. In other words, sometimes we just want to do it because say, God says, don't do it. I mean, how many of you were, are of that kind of person that says, you just need to tell me what I can't do, and I'm definitely going to do it. I mean, let's face it, with those with young kids, John, do your kids do everything you tell them to do? Do they not love to not do and push a boundary? Some we call it the terrible twos, and oh, there's the terrible threes, and the terrible fours, and there's the terrible 18s and 19s, and, you know, boundaries is something we set as parents, but we love to set them for others, but we don't want them for ourselves, do we? Now, the second reason... Um, that we can find it burdensome is that sometimes we lack, we feel we lack the power, the willpower or the, th or the strength not to do the things we know we should do not do. Um, we find ourselves overwhelmed by an urge to just do it anyway. We know we should do it. Somehow we know we don't want to do it and yet we still do it anyway because it's itching, it's nagging and it's this temptation and it goes on and on. And there is, it's not wanting to disobey it's actually finding it really hard to obey. You could say this is the same thing, but I think there is a real difference. And the third reason is this, is we might sometimes see God's command and burdensome. You know, the, we, we begin to think that actually God doesn't really care about our welfare. You know, he's out, he's out there to rob us of what little fun we can have with his stern and mean-spirited spirit who loves to do nothing more than make his people miserable and declaring everything that's fun off limits. That's probably the third thing that people will see in, in reasons to, to not follow. And so, let's look once again at those three reasons, and look, let's look at the reality of what the Bible is actually telling us on this subject. You know, the reason we don't want to obey is because it's, it's probably a state we're in before we become Christians. We just don't want to obey. I mean, actually, that's the whole point where we need saving because we've spent up to a point in life where we've chosen to turn to God to just say, I'm just going to live my life my way. In actual fact, Frank Sinatra, I did it my way. Well, good luck to you, Frank, because that's, not, that's probably not going to lead it. But actually, one thing you will find is when you turn to God, the Holy Spirit comes into you. And it sounds very spooky and spiritual, but God does send His Spirit to recreate us, to change His desires, to work inside of you. The desires you're going to have when you become a Christian are going to change. I can remember this story, I think it was Gavin Carver that told me, and I'm, I don't want to re-say it because I'm not going to say it right, but it was about somebody who had never heard of God, of the Bible, of anything, attending a meeting 
and on that night became a Christian. I had absolutely zero Bible knowledge at all whatsoever, but on that night took Jesus as a saviour and walked away a saved person. And then she came back and saw the minister, you know, being saved, it was great, she discovered that, and then she came back and she's like, oh, oh, oh um, I tend to do, you know, I sleep around, I have all these this and that. Should I carry on doing that? You probably shouldn't. Right, 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 right. Went back and sorted that out and came back and, uh, ooh, I like, you know, I take drugs and should I not do that? Mm, no, it's not really good for it. Right, 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 right. And her life changed a bit at a time as she realized what she needed to change. But there was not that, oh, this is rubbish. There was that enthusiasm because the Spirit of God was working and working from the inside to change and create that desire to live a life that's more in line with what God expects from us. So actually, when God then, you know, forbids some kind of activity like, you know, any form of, let's call it sexual immorality, in, all, in any of its form, at the end of the day, what you're going to find is yourself being in agreement with God. You're right, God. You know, the appeal of sexual immoral- immorality is losing its grip on my heart. Because I know doing it gives me an immediate physical satisfaction But if I come to discover that the pleasures of obedience and fellowship with God are far, far more satisfying than the short-term pleasures of disobedience, that is when you will realize the true fulfillment you can feel in your life. There is absolutely no doubt, and I'm sure we can all testify it, when we disobey, when we do it wrong, what comes after is not usually the best of feelings. It's not a great feeling at all. The temptation was good, the allure was good, and possibly the moment was good, but what comes after is really not so great at all. And actually, years of being a Christian, I've confirmed that so many times. You find no better sense of peace, satisfaction, fulfillment, actually doing what God says. So actually, I do not for one minute believe that God, the disobeying God in any way, brings me any joy, will it ever bring me any joy? Quite the contrary, obedience, it will brings peace and joy and happiness. And forgive me for saying that, Catherine, but w- would it be fair to say you found a bit of that in your testimony on, on sorry, I'm not putting you on the spot, but, you know, you, you, hearing you encouraged me in, 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 in the thought in, in this front, that in the end, walking away from God and doing it your own way, in the end, you don't feel joy, you don't feel peace, you don't feel satisfaction. It's like that little illustration with the money, I'll do it my way, I'll do it with my money. I'll make myself happy with my money. Don't work. That's not a sin, but it doesn't work. It doesn't work. Second reason, this is now looking at our lack of strength and power. You might want to obey, but when a temptation can, you just feel it's just too hard to resist. It's just somehow it's eating up, and you think the only way I'm going to get rid of this is just by doing it, and maybe the feeling, this itching feeling will go away. It's so hard, the temptation. And yet, the Bible promises that God will provide us with everything we need to help us and empower us to resist. Look at this passage here. Uh, sorry, where? I'm going about 10 slides behind now. There we go. Oh, um, there we go to this one. So this is an interesting passage. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Now, just imagine for one minute, the verse stopped at, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Boom, ends there. That wouldn't be particularly good. In actual fact, that sounds horrible and burdensome again. It's like, I'm going to scare you to death, human, because you're going to obey me. That would be quite awful. But it's the second half that tells us what we need to know. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. God's working in us. It's like a whole construction site continuously going on in our lives. God's spirit is continually working at us in a way that any naturalistic or materialistic person would never understand. There's a genuine spiritual element of something, a work that God is doing in your life, and he's equipping you. Look at what it says in Hebrew. Now may the God of peace uh, who brought again from the dead... actually. In my notes, I've actually cut half of that. I'll say this. I'm going to read it. Now, may the God of peace equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us 
that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ. God does not expect you to do it alone. He is wanting to do it with you from within, with you. And that's why it's not burdensome, because God is there to do it for you. He's going to equip you, and he's going to change you to make it happen. The third reason, when we look at it, that um, you know, it can seem burdensome and overwhelming, is our question about God's character, questioning God's character himself. You know, there are people out there who think God is unloving, he's overly strict, and he's kind of a cosmic killjoy. He's just going to take all the fun away from everything we're doing. Um, and actually, some Christians end up confused when they're facing tough times. Adversity, sickness, persecution, and all sorts of trials. Actually, God knows that people are asking, you know, why doesn't God do something? How can he let go this go on in the life of his children? Now, the reality is that God knows that this kind of confusion can lead to discouragement. I didn't even despair. Um, there's, um, I've not, I don't think I've put it on the screen. Um, yeah, no, I haven't. I would refer you to Hebrews chapter 12. I'm not going to read it. But if you feel that way sometimes, oh, God, you're hard work. Why do you make my life so difficult? Are you a real killjoy? Do you, are you intent on making my life difficult? Hebrews 12 deals with it really nicely. I'm just going to pick the bits. Uh, and if you want to go and read it yourself later, I encourage you to do so. Because actually, in the passage, it does say that unless people might grow weary or faint-hearted. And in another translation, it says not grow weary or lose heart. So the writer of Hebrews is well aware that some of the challenges in his life might just get people to give up. And it's a concern the writer has that people might just give up because the going is too tough. God, this is too difficult. Can't do it. Sorry, this is not for me. And actually, he uses in verse 12 the image of a runner. Of a runner that's running the race and again growing weary. And the, you know, the sort of end point is just too hard and you run, you know. Have you ever had those dreams? That's exactly your dream. You're trying to run and something's holding you back. You know, you just can't do it. And it just, you just never get there. Now, in that chapter, Hebrew 12, it gives us an amazing answer because it brings clarity to why this happens to us. Because if there's one thing now I've learned in my life, is to be ready for the next crisis or the next disaster. If things are going well, don't live your life thinking, right, I've got it all sorted, it's going to be good because you're just going to get hit by the next crisis that comes. So I far prefer thinking, ooh, it's been a while since I've had a crisis. When is it coming? Because at least when it comes, I'm not surprised. You know, don't be surprised. It will come. It's going to hit you. If you're riding that wave, that wave will run out. So, but that, that, that's how I deal with the fact that there are challenges in life. I'm not, I'm not going to pretend, and I'm not going to hope that the rest of my life uh, things are going to be perfect. So in, in, his answer is this. You know, whether you're feeling physical pain or, or difficulties at work or financial difficulties or opposition from even people who, who are non-believers who are having a go at you, giving you a hard time, it's not due to God's anger or because God's neglecting you. It's got nothing to do with that at all. Actually, what Hebrew 12 says, and, you know, I encourage you to read it, is that actually these are almost ways to sharpen and build us, and strengthen us. Adversity, which in this passage he calls discipline, is actually the expression of God's love and care and concern. Being put through a hard time is God's best way to build your faith. And in other words, in Hebrews 12, the point is that whatever struggles you encounter, whatever pain you endure, Whatever discipline might seem to be coming our way through what you're going through, it is motivated by God's passionate love for us as his children. It's motivated by God's passionate love for us as his children. Now, we are grown up, most of us in this room, but we know with our kids some discipline, boundaries, you know. Well, you disobeyed, you grounded, you know, no Phone, that's the worst punishment these days. No phone for a week. It's like a death penalty for a child these days. 
we're quite happy to give it to our kids, but when God gives it to us, it's like, whoa, hey, I'm grown up, don't discipline me anymore. I know, you know. No, actually, God, out of love for us, will discipline us in whatever way, shape, or form. He's his right to do it. So let's not think, again, for one minute, we are beyond that discipline. Because if we do, when it comes, we're going we're gonna to wonder what's hitting us. So it's not, when things are tough, when things don't go right, it's not because he's disappointed or irritated with us. It's because he's overwhelmingly loving us and devoted to our own welfare. Verse 6 in, in Hebrews 12 says, He loves those he disciplines. So that's to say, you know, if God commands you to do something or forbids you from participating, it's his way of showing his love. He's training you. He is disciplining you and he's educating you to live in such a way that your joy and your happiness and satisfaction will grow and expand and intensify. God is treating you as his beloved sons and daughters. So don't ever go think that his commandments, his prohibitions that we find are motivated by God's disapproval or a lack of love. It's actually quite the opposite. It's out of love for us that God has set boundaries, put limits, defined the right of wrong. And I'm sorry, I have uh, labored on this point for quite a bit, but I felt it was so important. And this is where I say this chapter, you could weeks on doing sermons, that word burdensome had so much behind it, I just, I just felt the need, to, um, the need to, to drill through it. So I'm almost done. If you think how many more pages have you got to flick through, there's two and a half. So it's not going to take too long. Um, so everything we get taught in the Bible is not burdensome. That's exactly what Paul is telling us. It's not heavy. It is light. It is not hard. It's easy. If you're willing to work with God, and if you accept his understanding and let him, because, I mean, at the end of the day, we have to let him. You know, we're going to live our lives always battling this duality. Yes, we are saved. That salvation is guaranteed. But we're still going to have this battle for the rest of our lives between what we want to do and what God wants us want to do. That is always going to go on. And I think we're a bit like a chest of drawers, where it's like, right, God, you can access my left-hand side drawers. The right-hand side is mine. Or in a case, laughing in our bedroom with Tony and I, I'll have three quarters. Well, she'll have three quarters and I'll have those two. Whatever it is, we all have these little drawers in our lives that we don't want God to open. Well, well that's a no-go area, God. You are not messing about with my freedom. You're not messing about with what I do with my money. God, you are not messing about with what I do on a Sunday morning or a Friday night or whatever. We're always going to battle that. We're always going to have this battle. And that's why I think that quote that we shared last week is the ultimate, that nothing, there is no go, there is no, no go area in my life that you cannot have access to. That is the ultimate, but that is not always so easy. So the right journey, really, for us, from the moment we are saved to the moment it all ends, is a bit at a time to give up an extra draw to God. We can't always do it all in one go. And God will tell you, God will make you aware which is the next draw he wants to take control of. And it'll be for you to decide whether you're willing to do it because you understand that God's doing it out of love or you're going to see him as a killjoy and know this bit, you are not touching because I've, I just love this bit too much and it's not for you to touch. We've got this thing that we know best, don't we? We know best. Don't mess with this. I need my ex. I need this amount of money. I need this amount of time for myself because I think it's best. We're not willing sometimes to accept that God knows what's best for us. So, oh no, I thought I had another try. You know, do you want what God wants? Do you feel you need God's help? If you do, this is what uh, we have again uh, from this passage, from verse 14. So we're back now to 1 John chapter 5. This is the confidence we have in approaching God that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Anything. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we asked of him. 
So God's just, God's just like that. If you need help, if you want that help, if you want him involved, just ask and he will be there. So that leads us to our last one, is really back to Jesus' second command. We, we, we mentioned the first one earlier, to love your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. The second one, love your neighbor as you, as you love yourself. And that's, again, John 5 brings us back to it. You know, how do we know we love God? By obeying his commands and by loving um, his children. Now, I'm going to be quite short. Um, I've, I have got an illustration. Uh, this, again, it's from my, this, this trip. On my way back, uh, and I'd booked it on purpose, I had, the, I had the opportunity to fly on an A380. Now, for all of you, that might mean nothing, but it's basically the, big, the biggest plane, a double-decker plane. Absolutely incredible. And finally, if I have a bucket list, that was one I, was willing to, I wanted to fulfill, to be on an A380 and to be on the upper deck. I mean, how, how better does life get? And just as I was getting to the gate, a lady says, oh, you've got a new seat. So I've got a new seat. And the way you board this plane, you've got the bit that boards the bottom and the bit that boards the top. And I was, I said, it was zone E, whatever. And I was not going to the upstairs. And I thought, oh, dear me, this is not good. Get on the plane. I say to the guy, I've booked a seat to be upstairs. Oh, sorry, we've changed the plane. Upstairs is just first class now. So maybe I'll get upgraded. I want to sit upstairs. Oh, no, sir, there's your seat and blah, de, blah, de, blah. So I was now getting, I was in the right mood. I was not happy at all. <laughs> sit on the plane. I mean, I, I, this was my second flight and I'd pretty much been up all night. It's like, this is not good. Sit down and actually the guy, I think you could see the guy was, you know, you could see I wasn't happy. I said, look, we're putting in a seat with extra leg room. It's kind of the first row and it's a bit more leg room. So, right, okay, still not happy. Sit down. Two minutes later, what rocks up? A couple with a baby. Yay, nine hours next to a baby. <laughs> And you know, the last WhatsApp I sent to my family as I was boarding was exactly like, I'm in the bottom, and I'm next to a baby. I was really fuming. <laughs> and then I realized, love your neighbor. This is, this is going really well. And actually, the conclusion of that flight is that this couple with a baby, we were best friends by the end of it, because I realized my attitude was so bad, so wrong. In actual fact, you don't even know whether you're sitting up or down. It's like, well, yeah, you just higher up when you look out the window, but that's about it. And this couple had nine hours of battling this little girl who didn't want to sleep. And actually, all she did all throughout the flight was just this to me. She was just like this the whole time. And I realized this couple doesn't need a moody 50-year-old idiot who's going to moan about their child. <laughs> and, and I realized the right attitude, love your neighbor. And it was lovely. They were a couple of, a British couple that lived in Dubai, and they were coming back from the summer. And this little girl was really cute if I could just see the cuteness rather than in the annoyance. And she, she was lovely, actually. So that was my lesson about loving your neighbor. So I'm not going to come and lecture you guys. Sometimes you might not be wanting to love your neighbor. Uh, but that's what God wants us to do. And actually, again, it's when it hurts, when it's somebody we really on face of it do not like and do not want to like. And we can find lots of examples in our, in our lives. We can find lots of examples in our society. You know, BCM, go towards the people we probably want to love the least. You know, the right bottom of our society, the most marginalized, the people who stink, the people who, you know, are, are make us feel uncomfortable. Loving your neighbor is not about loving the nice, friendly people that we like. It's about going towards those situations that we find really tough. And that's, that's part of growing. And that's what John 5 is telling us. John 5 talks about a lot of other things. Um, or if you fancy, we could spend another three hours and deal about this sin that leads to death. And I decided to stay well away from that, those few verses. Um, but instead, I'm just going to conclude with the four points, hopefully, uh, I've been able to share with you today. Number one, never forget your salvation is certain. That's an absolute must. But then, do love God with all your heart. And following his commands is not burdensome. Because you will see that when you do it, it feels good. It feels absolutely great to follow God's commands and love your neighbor as yourself. Because just as I, this silly example of the flight, the way I was feeling at the, at the start before we took off was not good. 
I was just feeling I'm going to have the rubbishest next well, many hours in the plane. But having tried to do the opposite of what I felt like doing in order to try and be a loving physical neighbor, I felt so great on arrival. It felt so great because I'd managed, despite my frustrations, to love my neighbor. So let's take these thoughts away with us. Um, and maybe let's just pray for a second. I'm really sorry. I didn't realize I would be this long, but um, we'll ju let's just pray. Dear God, we thank you that you're an amazing God, an awesome God. You're not a cosmic killjoy. You're not there to burden us, to upset us, to frustrate us, to make our life challenging. You are there to make us live our life to the full in line with you. Help us recognize that and embrace it and join it and follow you wherever you want to go and obey whatever you want us to change in our lives, Lord. We ask for these things in your name. Amen. Right, let's uh, finish off by singing our last chorus. So, I don't know. Let's stand up and sing after the introduction.
sing the grace to each other. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the Holy Ship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.